to speak with you today. And so this is our lawn care basics uh, webinar. So just discussing the primary uh, lawn care factors to consider for warm season grass. In terms of, and so let's go ahead and go with the introduction. So my name is Will. I'm one of the members here at the, uh, the yard advising team here at Sunday. So if you do have any questions, we are part of uh, our support team. So essentially you may be interacting with us if you have any questions regarding the law and if you send in a picture, um, it, essentially we are some of the agents who will be more than happy to chat with you. And here with me today is also Ivana and I'll pass it on over to her and introduce herself. <clears throat> hey y'all, I'm Ivana. Um, I'm also your art advisor. I have a bachelor's degree of science in horticulture from Texas State. Uh, shout out to Bobcats. Um, and I'll just be helping Will out um, having some of the questions that people sent in and just clarifying some things and stuff like that. Perfect. Thanks, Yvonne. And all right, so just in terms of a couple of notes, I'm not sure if you heard the recording uh, sound pop up just a moment ago. So this webinar is being recorded just so any of our attendees who um, are unable to stay for the webinar in its entirety or for any of our registrants who are unable to attend today will still be able to view it in its entirety. But rest assured, your cameras and microphones are both turned off. Uh, secondly, at the conclusion of the webinar, you will automatically um, be shown a screen for a follow-up survey. We would truly appreciate any feedback. This is a new venture for Sunday, and we're extremely excited to see it grow. If, however, you're unable to complete the web or the follow-up survey at the end of the webinar, no worries. You will be receiving a follow-up email roughly 24 hours from now. Uh, containing both the recording of the webinar and a link to the follow-up survey. And lastly, uh, keep a, an eye out for any questions. So instead of submitting any questions in the chat box at the bottom of your screen, we just ask you to submit those in the Q&A box. This will allow Yvonne to be better able to interact with you and essentially for us to be able to uh, record the questions. So Yvonne, was there anything I missed there before? Just a brief recap. No, I think that's everything. Yeah, um, just make sure you throw them in the question, the Q and A box. Um, it's easier for me to see and easier for us to kind of integrate into the presentation. But yeah, you covered everything. Perfect, great. So just brief recap, or one webinar is being recorded, but your cameras and uh, microphones are both turned off. Secondly, keep an eye out for the follow-up email with the recording and the link to the follow-up survey. And lastly, all questions, please submit in the Q and A box. Perfect. Go ahead and get started. So today, the four primary uh, practices or actions that we'll be discussing are watering, mowing, fertilizing, and repairing. But before we dive into this, I do believe it's beneficial to take a step back and essentially consider the course uh, for the season. I believe we have a, at least one attendee in the transitional zone, so we may have a, be in an area where your neighbor potentially has a cool season grass, or you may see some lawns that are a cool season blend, but your lawn is actually a warm season grass. So it is useful just to have this general um, chart in mind to keep in mind when exactly we expect the peak growth or uh, the peak time of year to be versus when uh, we may have a, a bit of a downtime. <laughs> So getting started here, of course, winter, we have just passed this or just about to. In the wintertime, we really encourage grass isn't growing. Um, and this is a great time to essentially be developing a plan for the upcoming season, right? So identifying any problem areas from the previous season. Do we need to consider aerating this year? Soil is compacted. Should we look to top dress? Are there any areas which we will need to repair over the course of the season? Would we um, decide to propagate? or decide to see the area, would we look to install plugs depending on the grass type? So this is really a great time where I encourage essentially just taking a step back and considering the, the plan for the upcoming season. If, however, this was not completed, this is that's completely fine, right? Especially even in early spring, I would say I still wouldn't expect, even if the grass is starting to green up a bit, this isn't when I would expect the grass to quite be actively growing yet, right? So I wouldn't be necessarily fertilizing at this point uh, or um, watering, mowing, depending on the region. So once temperatures are still, I would say in the 50, 60 degree range or so, grass might start to green up in the 60 degree range and upwards, but it won't be until generally we start to hit consistently 70 degree temps during the day where I would expect the grass to really start to hit its stride, right? And so late spring, mid to late spring is when I would expect 
will start to water, will start to mow. Your first uh, nutrient application will most likely be taking place at this point. But again, we still haven't hit that maximum growth rate yet, which will be typically sometime during the beginning to middle of summer. Temps are anywhere from 80 to 90 degrees or so during the daytime. And this is when we'll primarily be looking to consider uh, maintaining the lawn from a watering perspective, mowing perspective, uh, the fertilizing perspective, but also if we do need to take a bit more of a comprehensive approach in terms of repairing any areas, uh, some of these practices such as aerating or top dressing that may be a bit uh, stressful to the grass with, that we don't want to be completing um, too late into the season or too early in the season. This is an optimal time to do so. But we do generally tend to see a bit of a dip, right? The grass doesn't necessarily slow down to what we would expect in dormancy, right? Or at the beginning of the season. But if temperatures become extreme, uh, and the grass does begin to experience um, heat stress, for example, then we may see that grass start to slow down a little bit. Again, this doesn't mean that this isn't a period of time where we would expect to stop doing anything, right? But this may be a period, a period of time where we're looking to water the lawn, essentially keep in mind uh, the time of year and, and prepare for once the temps begin to drop, again, back into that 80 to 90 degree range primarily. So two peak growth times, right? So beginning of summer or so, and then also most likely late, late summer, early fall before the grass will eventually start to slow down and enter dormancy again. So again, I don't wanna to spend too much time on this, but specifically for our customers in uh, the transitional zone, it is useful to consider from winter to let's say mid spring, there's going to be minimal energy, right? Required from mid-spring to let's say just about late spring to early summer, a bit more. And then the peak time of year where there's going to be a greater focus on both maintaining the grass and completing some of these practices, be beginning of summer, bit of a downturn before peaking again, and then starting to slow down as well, entering uh, the fall season, then winter. So we're actually getting into the content here in terms of the key components of lawn care from a watering perspective, there are three key points that we look to consider. And these are essentially maintaining a deep and infrequent watering schedule. So generally the natural inclination is to, as soon as the temperatures begin to warm up or to, to increase to water more frequently, right? So if you are watering, let's just say once per week um, during the spring or early summer, as soon as the temps start to skyrocket, it might be, you might feel the need to water daily, right? Just to essentially saturate the, that soil surface, but this is not what we want to promote, right? So what we instead would like to do on the left-hand side, what we expect to see for a nice healthy turf grass, essentially following a deep and infrequent watering schedule, promoting deeper roots and essentially making the grass um, more resourceful, if you will, searching for moisture within the soil. If we instead shift to a more frequent um, but shorter watering schedule, right? So watering every day, for example, and for a shorter period of time, those grassroots are essentially going to start to, to um, show up and establish closer to the soil surface. So what this tends to look like is even though we're looking most likely um, to address heat concerns, since the roots are more are uh, established much closer to the soil surface, they're going to be more susceptible to heat stress. So this is a key point to keep in mind where even if um, the temps are starting to warm up a bit, we still want to follow or practice that deep and infrequent schedule. Generally, deep and infrequent, what does that translate to? We're really looking at a minimum of between three tenths of an inch to half an inch of water per session. Uh, if there's little to no precipitation, this is a very specific value, right? And there's always going to be um, a, a bit of variation, right? So what we strongly encourage doing is looking for signs of heat stress, right? So your grass is going to show you essentially when it needs to be watered. So this typically shows up as the um, grass blades essentially folding up in half in an effort to conserve uh, water, adopting almost a bluish grayish hue and footprints remaining in the lawn if you're walking across the lawn. So instead of following a set, I'm going to water one time per week in the spring and two times per week um, at the beginning of summer and then trying to increase from there if the temperatures begin to warm, begin to increase. Instead while I'm be comfortable with adjusting that watering schedule as needed, right? If it's a bit more of a dry season, then we don't necessarily need to um, increase to a daily watering schedule, right? But we may have to just adjust either the number of times that we're watering per week or the duration, depending on what the current uh, watering schedule is. 
And lastly, a, a focus on early morning watering. So we want to minimize the amount of time that the soil is essentially remaining moist. What we can tend to see is if watering early uh, in the evening, let's say five or six at night, um, then that that lawn could essentially be remaining moist a little bit longer. We prefer then if you essentially water it in the morning time, water is still being absorbed, the, the grass is still benefiting from it, but essentially we can minimize the risk of a fungal uh, issue developing. Okay, well, I just wanted to clarify a couple of things. Um, one thing would be kind of touching on how people can measure the output of their sprinklers and how they know they're getting um, that um, 0.3 to 0.5 inches. Yeah, great question. So. We include, there's an article on our blog, which we'll be discussing later in the webinar, um, essentially discussing how to audit your sprinkler system, but this is a practice that we recommend completing each season, right? Just to make sure we understand essentially the water output in each section of our lawn. What this typically translates to is you can either, we sell sprinkler gauges uh, on our website that you can set up throughout the lawn. They're very easy to use, essentially have the, the markings right on them to be able to uh, determine how how much water was uh, put down by the sprinklers, but theoretically you could also use any uniform surface, right? Some customers will decide to use like a, a tuna can, for example, and just set them up throughout the lawn. You run the sprinklers for, let's say, 15 minutes or a set period of time, determine how long uh, or how much water is put down in that amount of time, then from there we'll be better able to understand how long you'd need a water to achieve that three tenths of an inch to half an inch um, of water per session. Really good question. Yeah. Another thing I want to touch on is the watering in the early morning. Um, part of that is because a lot of areas in the south, especially in the southeast, stay pretty humid. Um, so we don't want the soil and the grass to stay wet for too long because that can increase a lot of fungal issues. Fungus really likes warm, wet temperatures. So we want to be mindful of that going to the growing season. Um, areas you could water in the evening if you do need that extra um, water retention would be places in the southwest, Arizona. New Mexico, Nevada, places like that, um, West Texas, um, just places to where it can take longer to absorb because they have kind of that leeway with it being less humid. All right, transitioning to our second component here, mowing. So uh, generally a relatively simple practice, right? I never placed much thought into this when uh, growing up and mowing the back lawn, but this is a crucial component to consider, right? And the first point here is making sure that the mower blade is sharp. Um, so included on the left here, you can see uh, a lawn that has essentially been mowed with the dull mower blade. So what we tend to see is over the course of the season, especially as it begins to warm up a bit more, customers may reach out with a photo of a lawn that's starting to brown or starting to yellow, right? And they're thinking, you know, I haven't changed my watering schedule at all. Uh, could it just be the heat? What's occurring here, right? And then when we look at the close-up photos, we see these torn uh, grass blades. And so what this can be is you can imagine how if you're essentially tearing at the grass blade, how that's going to stress the grass. But in addition, this is jumping to our third point here on the slide, we wanna make sure that we're not removing too much of the grass blade during one cut. So generally this translates to removing less than one third of a blade per cut. Um, so if it is a dull blade, it's very possible you're essentially going to be removing more than uh, the desired amount, which is going to stress the grass and essentially lead to a, a almost a yellow, um, a yellowish appearance to the lawn. So very crucial. Generally recommend, what would you say, Vaughn, once, once every season or so? Yeah, I like to do it at the start of spring. Um, typically sanitize and sharpen once in the spring, and then I like to touch it up again um, kind of late summer, early fall, when the grass is growing up a little bit more. Perfect. And then in terms of mowing height, this can vary depending on your specific uh, grass type, right? But generally, we would say a little bit shorter than most of our cool season grasses. So cutting once uh, the grass blades reach a height of three to four inches or so and cutting down to two to two inches to three inches somewhere there, just making sure that we're not, not removing more one third of the blade during one cut. Mm -hmm. And something we see often too, we get a lot of questions about scalping as a practice. Um, I know a lot of places recommend it. Um, something to keep in mind is you really only want to scalp with the Bermuda or Zoysia lawn. Um, these grasses can grow rhizomes under the soil instead of having stolons on top. Um, they prefer being a little bit shorter. They look neater. Um, so something scalping is something you really only want to do the first mow of the season um, as you're removing that dead material from it being dormant. Um, and that would be just the practice of cutting it shorter than you normally do. 
instead of cutting it to two to three inches, cutting it 1.5 to two if it's a graph that can take a little bit shorter. But again, scalping is something you just want to practice with the Bermuda or Azulja lawn. Um, it can damage your San Augustine um, or any other type of grass like that. So you just want to be mindful of what kind of grass you have. Thanks, Anna. Wonderful. Moving right along, going to our third component here, fertilizing. The true bread and butter of Sunday, right? And so with the, the nutrient pouches, um, you mind why? <laughs> so not all soils are perfect, right? And so Sunday does practice or follow uh, MLSN or minimum levels of sustainable nutrition guidelines. So essentially providing what the soil needs and nothing more, right? So if there is a nutrient deficiency detected by your soil test, we'll be addressing that. But otherwise, I, I would just think of these pouches as uh, food for food for the lawn, right? In terms of when to apply these pouches this year, this is so different. If you have been a, um, a customer with us for longer than just this season, we are now offering our My Plan page. So this is essentially a digital experience where you're able to see right on your account page when uh, the recommended application dates are, instructions for each, and then also a, a nice checklist. And you can see where I, I missed my last application last season. So you're able to track your progress. And if you do um, need to adjust an application, you'll be reminded as I am when I log in. <laughs> uh, keep in mind though, that the application dates are not set in stone, right? So we really want to make sure that the grass is currently actively growing and green, right? That's the first condition that we consider. And then secondly, that the grass is not currently stressed. Any fertilizer is going to stress the grass or is going to um, exacerbate the stressful conditions if the grass is already currently stressed, right? So in the summertime, for example, if the grass is showing signs of drought stress, I would hold off on that nutrient pouch application and we can then incorporate it uh, once the conditions uh, allow, right? And so th this is, the schedule is fairly flexible, right? We can allow, typically if we allow at least 10 days or so in, be in between different pouch applications, the risk of a nitrogen burn or over fertilization will be minimal. So just keep in mind, this is a good starting point, but any questions, always feel free to reach out and we can tweak your, uh, your schedule as needed. And well, we did have a question just about um, in between fertil fertilizer applications, if there's any maintenance they need to do after applying fertilizer, if there's, you know, rinsing out their sprayers or anything like that. Really good question. So I do generally recommend after you complete an application, just rinsing out the sprayer, right? So what we can see is if a pouch has been sitting a lot around for a significant period of time, um, or if you have difficulty applying the, uh, the pouch, essentially that liquid can start to coagulate a little bit, right? So if you allow that to sit in that sprayer, then that can sometimes lead to issues with the application. So just a good practice to essentially, once you're done applying a pouch, flush the, um, the hose and sprayer, just to make sure nothing's going to essentially build up and you'll be all set for your next application. All right, lastly, transitioning into repairing here. This is a very busy slide, but we'll be <laughs> uh, downsizing it here in just a moment. I did just wanna highlight for anyone who is, um, again, new to warm season grasses or grew up up north where there were uh, cool season grasses, this is a really good chart. Um, just sort of discussing some of the differences or rank, provide the tolerances of the different grasses, right? And so shortening this list a bit, the four primary warm season grasses Sunday tends to discuss the most are Bermuda grass, centipede, St. Augustine, and zoysia, right? But depending on which grass you have, if there are any thinner areas, we may have to adjust essentially our, our method of repairing these spots. So we do want to maintain a lush lawn and essentially to minimize the amount of bare soil, right? Prevent weeds from becoming an issue by essentially eliminating the environment available for them uh, to take hold. So to a certain extent, warm season grasses for the most part are going to naturally fill in uh, some of these some in some of these bare areas either via rhizomes and or uh, stolons. But with Bermuda grass, for example. We do offer Bermuda grass seed, Bermuda thyme. It germinates fairly quickly, establishes fairly, fairly quickly from seed. So this is a good option. Uh, if you have Bermuda, it's certainly a, a great way to repair any thinner areas. If you have St. Augustine, for example, uh, which does not produce viable seed, then plugs may be a great option, right? So you can essentially install plugs throughout the area to speed up the repair process. Or as a final option, install sod, right? And so 
Some warm season grasses you are able to purchase seed for, so centipede and zoysia, for example. Sunday does not offer grass seed for these two uh, warm season grasses. And keep in mind that they can take, they generally take a significant amount of time to germinate and then to establish uh, from seed. So if you do have any thinner areas of, of, centipede, of centipede or zoysia, feel free to reach out. We can chat about um, any tips or, or essentially how to best address these areas, but seed can sometimes take a bit longer than, than we prefer. And we do often get questions on how to kind of make this process go more quickly and kind of help that grass fill in those bare areas. And something that I highly recommend and tell everybody that I talk to um, is something called top dressing. This is just the process of adding some topsoil or compost to those areas um, just to make sure you've got some fresh, you know, softer soil for those grasses to root into. Um, another tip too, if you're using something like the plugs or the natural method, is just to pin down the stolons that you're using to spread those into those areas with something like a bobby pin or like an unfolded paper clip just to get them to move in the right direction um, because they're not going to stay there unless you know you have something to kind of keep them where they're supposed to be perfect yeah that's a really good point about and this is one of those conversations that we sometimes have right where it's do we need to go the do we need to necessarily go sort of the aggressive approach and install plugs or to essentially overhaul the area? It may be if we just add a bit of topsoil, the grass may naturally just spread into the area a bit, right? Or um, installing plugs will, after top dressing will certainly speed up the process as well. Definitely a great, great practice. Perfect. So in terms of lawn care practices or essentially lawn care basics, those are the four key um, practices which we, we wanted to focus on today. Of course, there are other actions uh, to keep in mind. I know that we'll be offering an additional webinar, I believe, next week. So next week for dealing with weeds, Ivana will be Ivana will be heading that with one of our other yard advisors, and then we'll also be providing an order of operations uh, webinar, which will go more so into practices and less so from a product perspective. So, for example. If you're looking to aerate, when would you do so in relation to the Sunday plant? So definitely keep an eye out for that webinar. That'll be a, a great, great one, but you'll be stuck with me for that one as well. <laughs> do we have any last minute questions here before we transition just into resources and essentially follow up, um, follow up information? I think we answered most of them. Um, one of them just was, um, for people in a transition zone, um, do we have a good few options for cool season grasses that they can get away with that? Oh, really good question. Yes. So we do offer a variety uh, of cool season grasses, right? Generally, I would say in the transition zone, I'd be looking most likely for a tall fescue to really prioritize that heat tolerance. But um, so in that case, our fescue rescue would be a great option, but we can also spend a significant amount of time chatting. <laughs> so feel free, we can collect your email address and then we can uh, go from there. That's all the questions we had, Will. Perfect. All right. Well, coming to our last slide then, uh, just want to highlight a few resources. So number one, our blog, The Shed, is a great resource or a great starting point. Uh, these articles are uh, typically the starting point for the majority of our yard advisors when we're getting started in terms of learning more um, uh, or providing resources for some of our customers, right, as a general summary of some of our conversations. So uh, articles discussing how to test for soil compaction, for example, or uh, an article such as how to choose a plant for your back backyard. Secondly, our YouTube channel is a great resource as well. We provide a number of um, videos provide product overviews, how to's, chats with our very own Dr. Frank Rossi from my alma mater, Cornell University. Uh, he is a great resource and uh, has some great conversations on our YouTube channel. And then, lastly, if you do have any questions, please feel free to reach out to webinars at getsunday.com. Uh, this way, we are part of the customer support team. So, if you reach out to us at the general support at getsunday.com, there's a chance that you'll reach us directly, but the webinar's email here will be uh, the best option to, to get in touch with us. And Will, we did have one last minute question. Um, so we have uh, a customer who laid sod in the backyard. The front yard does have a lot of weeds um, and they just want to know um, if they can have a Sunday plan that tailors to both of those. Really good question. So 
Um, I'm assuming the same, same grass type? I believe so, but we can double check that. Okay. Yeah, so even if we have two different grass types, that, that won't be an issue, right? So our nutrient pouches are still are essentially designed to work with the majority of turf grasses, so I wouldn't be concerned there. Um, the bigger question that I would have would be sort of the extreme case if we had a cool season grass in one lawn and then a warm season grass in the other. Again, the products will still uh, still be great for both lawns, but we might just have to tailor the application schedules a bit. Um, from a weed control perspective, we do offer products depending on uh, the bundle you purchase. You may receive some herbicides already, but if not, no worries. We do offer them a la carte on our website as well. And we can certainly collect your information and chat about this in more detail, but Dandelion Doom and Weed Warrior are both uh, great spot treatments we can discuss. Perfect. All right. Well, it was an absolute pleasure, everyone. Uh, keep an eye out for the follow-up survey. This was Lawn Care Basics Warm. Um, truly appreciate you being here today. So please do not hesitate to reach out. We may be of any assistance. Hope to see you in our web webinar. Take care.